evening, everyone. I think we're about ready to start. We just have a few little electronic devices to uh, enable. Okay, great. And let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we are so profoundly grateful for all that you've blessed us with, the many graces and gifts you shower down upon us each and every day. And Lord, as we gather together, we know you are present in our midst. We open ourselves to the power of your Holy Spirit. And you ask us, Lord, to help us to be good and faithful servants, help us to be missionary disciples, help us to be good stewards to all you've entrusted to our care so that we might give you glory and we might serve our brothers and sisters to the best of our ability. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, I am really excited to be here and really excited to see all of you here and um, to present uh, what we're going to present tonight. And just for a little bit of context, uh, this has been a work primarily of our parish uh, leadership team. It's called the FLT Family Leadership Team, which is myself and the two parochial vicars, Sister Mary Agnes, uh, and then Don Regan, our business manager and facilities manager, Walter Plummer, uh, our uh, director of the Office of uh, Faith Formation and Evangelization, and Michelle Dushensky, our director of communications. So we're a group that meets every single week for an hour or an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and a half to talk through kind of the most the high level things happening uh, in St. Gertrude and trying to make good decisions about moving forward. So we've been working on this for several months. Uh, it's gone through many iterations. Uh, it kicked off, we took a whole full day retreat away from St. Gertrude and it was the seven of us plus Sean Ader who's a parishioner and also the director, or the director of the Center for New Evangelization here in the Archdiocese. He got us a great head start. He's here present tonight in the back corner with his family. So uh, anyway, he got us going on the right track and then we just kind of kept working and working on this. Um, so without further ado, here we go. So the first question, why is this important? Um, and there's several parts to the answer. One part to the answer is way back when we began the strategic planning process, which actually began under uh, Father George when he was still here, there was the first phase of that was assembling all kinds of paperwork and data for the consulting company. And one thing they asked for was your parish mission statement. And so we went searching and we found not one, but three parish mission statements. It wasn't clear when any of them were put together, uh, and it certainly didn't seem like any of the three were being used in any meaningful degree in the decisions that we were making as a parish. Um, and given the fact it was kind of a new time, you know, we were now finally, you might say, fully out of COVID. There had been tur complete turnover in the parish you know, parochial staff, you know, all three of us priests here now have been here less than two years. Um, a lot of turnover in the parish staff. Again, beacons of light happening in the archdiocese. There's a lot happening. And we felt that rather than just go back to one of the previous mission statements, it made more sense to, uh, so to speak, start from scratch and start anew. Um, so that was a big part of it. And also realizing that with the strategic planning report now complete and in our hands and having that report recommending uh, if you look at all the different suggestions and recommendations uh, there's literally hundreds of things we could potentially do from that report and knowing that there's no way we could do even most of them um, how do you make decisions how do you excuse me about little sound insulation there. Um, so of all the things we could potentially do in the months, the years ahead, how do you prioritize? How do you choose? Um, and the most logical answer would be, well, what's most central 
to who you are and to what your mission is and your vision for what the parish is going to be. And if we don't have that in order, how can we really make good decisions about the future? So those are some of the reasons why we felt it was important to visit this topic at this time. And the other big, well, I'll leave it at that and get to the next slide. What are the elements? So again, there's been mission statements before, but a mission statement by itself is only of somewhat limited use. And so thanks to the wisdom of Sean and also of Walter, uh, who've been very immersed in some of this before, um, what we realized is that a mission statement needs to be surrounded by a whole kind of kaleidoscope of other things that help to shape the bigger picture and understand the mission statement uh, and all the rest in a way that really helps us to move forward. So there's actually four elements that I'll present tonight. Um, and since these words, like mission statement, like a lot of different people can mean a lot of different things when they say them, I'm first gonna define our terms as we use them here. So the mission statement is who we are, why we exist, what we do, whom we serve. Kind of preview of coming attractions of the four elements. This is to me actually the most boring of them. It's actually the other things that get a lot more fascinating. Um, and the vision, who we aspire to be, that's the aspirational looking into the future. It's where we're going, who we want to become, our dream for the future. <coughs> then what's called the core values. What is it we cultivate? These are our virtues uh, that guide our decisions and interactions, but they're the virtues that shape the very culture of our place. And what kind of culture do you need to actually achieve the mission and the vision that you've already outlined? Then finally, what's called strategic anchors, core things that we are committed to, and they're, I love this word, lenses by which we can examine relative goods um, and make choices, prioritize choices among those relative goods or pillars, it's another term for intentional decision making. Okay. So first, the mission statement. And again, in my opinion, the least exciting of the four things we're doing tonight. Who we are. Who are we? We're a Roman Catholic parish in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati that is shaped and enlivened by the charism of the order of preachers. We teach and preach the truth we reverently celebrate the liturgy and sacraments, and we gather as a community so that all may encounter Jesus here. And when we were back, way back in that retreat day that we had with Sean, um, a big part of that was just like reflecting on our parish and what makes us unique, right? Um, I mean, every parish offers mass to some degree or another. But for us, we really, really emphasize the reverence by which we do that. I think to a greater degree than a lot of other places. I said there's lots of parishes out there. This is the only one in the archdiocese that's Dominican. And so the charism of the order of preachers is very central to who we are. And it informs sometimes overtly and sometimes uh, more covertly, it informs everything that we do. Um, and then those last three words uh, were chosen very intentionally, encounter Jesus here. You've seen that repeated on our website. You know, about a year ago at this time, they were plastered on, on billboards along I-71 uh, I and I-75. Um, so that was a very intentional use of those three words uh, to round out the mission statement. Next will be the vision, which is necessarily shorter, but the ideal of the vision is it's short enough that everyone can memorize it and know it by heart. The vision to be a community of disciples united in our Eucharistic Lord and sent to transform the world in the light of the gospel. So again, it starts with a gathering of people together, that's community, but not just any people, people who are disciples, 
intentional disciples, missionary disciples. This is the goal of who we want to be as a community. United together in our Eucharistic Lord, we had to mention that because this is a very Eucharistic parish, like a very, very Eucharistic parish. And he is the center of what we do, the source and the summit. And then this idea of being sent out to transform the world um, in the light of the gospel. So again, this is aspirational. I think all aspects of this we already do to some degree. I think honestly we could say there's some aspects we could do a lot better. You know, and for those who heard me preach this past Sunday, I point out to that, that third part, the being sent out to the world. That's an area where I think is a growing edge for us, that we haven't done as much or haven't done it as coherently and systematically as we could. And I'm really excited about the future. I'm super excited that, you know, just this past summer, we were able to hire Tyler Castrusi as a full-time coordinator for adult evangelization. And this is really a big time in his wheelhouse. This is something um, that all of us are involved in, but to have someone dedicated to it is, um, is really exciting. So that's the vision. Um, and again, it's just meant to be short, so it can be memorizable, but then we can kind of unpack a lot within that. Now the values. There's five of these. Again, these are virtues that shape a culture the kind of culture that we want to have here in order to help us most effectively accomplish uh, our mission and our vision. So we start with reverence. Again, something that we felt characterizes St. Gertrude. That we worship God with beauty and honor. And I'll have to say throughout the entire, starting from the retreat day, all the way through the months of this work, beauty is a word that came up again and again and again and again. It's something we clearly value in the music that we do, in the way we celebrate Mass. You know, walk through the halls of St. Gertrude's School and there's just stunningly beautiful art from Angelico and all the rest all along. Like, beauty matters to us. We believe that beauty is a, set, is a, a product of the reverence we have for God. So you worship God first and foremost with beauty and honor, but also realize that we can use the word reverence in relation to other people. And we do that by promoting the sanctity, promoting the family, again, something I think this parish does really well, um, and approaching each person, every person, as one made in God's image and likeness. Again, you see that play out in things like the strong pro-life commitment that characterizes our parish. Um, you see it um, in all kinds of ways. You know, the incredible service to the poor that the Ladies of Charity and the Knights of Columbus and so many others do. Um, that sense of reverence is really important. And the second one, humility. We give the first glory to God and recognize our limitations. It's a big part of humility, recognizing limitations, and thus our need to rely on each other to accomplish the ministry the Lord has entrusted to us. Um, to be a lone ranger, Yahoo cowboy, in the end is not going to accomplish very much for the kingdom of God. We all have limitations and weaknesses, and thus we need to rely on each other and trust that you know, one person's strengths makes up for someone else's weaknesses, and when we work together, we craft something really, really beautiful. And I just, there's so many people in this parish on the staff, so many among our parishioners who do such incredible work. And in like the year and a half I've been here, I've never seen one person brag. I've never seen one person with a puffed up ego talking about how great they are. I mean, humility, it, it, it's, it's really um, moving to me to see the humility and how many people do such great work and put in so much effort and never try to claim any of that credit for their own. Um, it's, it's really quite amazing. Third one, it's a word everyone uses in common language all the time. <laughs> magnanimity. Now magnanimity is a great virtue that Thomas Aquinas is very big on. And this is one of those areas where our Dominican part really comes through. 
magnanimity, and you can define it different ways, but in the end, it's a large heartedness um, that aspires to the great, not for one's own sake, but for the glory of God and for the good of others. So the definition here, we recognize God has given us abundant gifts, and he has. We have an amazing parish. We have many amazing people. We have growth happening in the parish, growth happening in the schools. We have a lot of people who are very financially generous, a lot of people very generous with their time. Um, we've been given an enormous amount. And because of that, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. That God expects great things, and so therefore we aspire to do great things for, first of all, his glory, and then for the good of others. And this is really, really important. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny, and in Catholic spirituality, you know, there's, there's often like two sides of a coin that together kind of paint the whole Catholic picture. And I think St. Therese, the little flower, and St. Catherine of Siena is a great example. Right? Therese was all about do the little things, right, with great love. Pick one pin up off the ground with great love and you can save the soul. Her little way. That's one side of the coin. And there's Catherine. Um, who is big in many ways, but in one of her letters, um, she's writing to someone else, and she tells that person, do not be satisfied with doing small things for God when God is asking of you great things. It's not enough to do the small things. If, if and God doesn't ask the great out of everyone, but if he's asking great things, you must do great things. And I'm quite convinced, and the work of our group was, that God is asking of us great things. Go big or go home. You know, we're not just going to have a little tiny Corpus Christi procession. We're going to write down Miami. Right? <laughs> big things. Um, you know, we're not just going to bring in any speaker to come talk at the parish. We're going to bring George Weigel, one of the most foremost Catholic scholars and, you know, lecturers in the entire country. Big things. Again, not for our sake, but because we believe they glorify God and they are helpful to the souls of those around us. The fourth one, generosity. We give ourselves wholeheartedly to our mission and willingly make sacrifices to serve God and neighbor. And again, that's something I've seen every day with my own eyes at this place. I am stunned and humbled by the sacrifices people make. And I'll start with my parish staff. They work extraordinarily hard, sometimes under very difficult circumstances. They never complain. They just work and work and work and give themselves again and again and again and again. None of them work 40 hours a week, not even close. They're way up in the stratosphere, and they do it out of the goodness of their own hearts that they realize there's something important and they're willing to sacrifice for it. And so many of our parishioners are the same way. I, mean, I can't imagine, like, at least we're like me, like unmarried, and that's great because I have no other re real responsibilities. But so many of you who have families and children and soccer practice and ballet, and, and still you're able to hear and spend, you know, five hours on some night because there's some big event and you're willing to do it. Um, so I really think generosity and sacrifice is another hallmark of this culture here at St. Gertrude. Then finally, this is the one maybe of the five that we're most working on, but intentionality, that we plan well and make decisions through a process of prayer and study and consultation. We're getting better at it, we're not fully there, one of the big roadblocks to this is the pastor who tends to get a good idea or hear a good idea and say, we're doing this, okay, we're doing it. And then like, everyone's like, whoa, like, how, how are we doing that, Father? You know, so this is kind of speaking to me. I have to learn, even if I'm super excited, to like, okay, let's take it to prayer and, and really make sure we understand everything before we just decide to jump in. Um, so these are, the, 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 again, the, the values that shape a culture. And culture is really important. I mean, to give an example, you know, we've, in the parish side of things, have been looking to hire a couple different positions in the last year. 
there have been multiple occasions where we get a CV and like the qualifications are great, experience is good, whatever. We bring someone in for that first interview. You know, when we finish it, the person leaves, and we kind of look at each other, and like the first thing someone says is, not a good culture fit. Every parish has its own culture, and even if someone has good qualifications, if they don't fit with our culture, it's not gonna work. So we've already, um, in a sense, been using things like this in some of the decision making that we've been making, okay? Last, strategic anchors, and these are actually, of all, the, all of these presentations, the only ones that are numbered, and that's intentional because these are in an order of priority. And again, these are the more concrete uh, lenses by which we will make decisions. So the first one, beautiful and robust sacramental life. We worship God from the heart of the church, that means we think as the church thinks, teach as the church teaches, even in areas that are controversial to those who don't think as the church thinks. Um, through frequent, there's that word again, and reverent, again, celebration of the sacraments and devotional life. This is a priority for us, to do liturgy and sacraments well, reverently, and to offer them to a degree that most places can't. We have three daily Masses a day. We have five Sunday Masses. We have confession six days a week, every time with at least two priests, sometimes three hearing at the same time. We get to Holy Week or we get to the week before Christmas, it might be six priests hearing at the same time. We can do that because of what we have here. Most parishes can't. Um, so, this, so both the reverence is important, but also the frequency, which gives people more opportunity and also as a way that we as a parish serve a greater, a greater population than just our own. I don't know the percentages, you guys might know better than I, but when you look at those lines in confession all the time, like who knows how many of them are not from our parish, but they're drawn here because of what we're able to offer. And that's a good thing, it's a good thing. Second, and again this is one where it's more of a growing edge for us, a systematic formation of discipleship. We prioritize formation of the whole person, intellectual, spiritual, human, apostolic, at each stage of life and at each stage of discipleship. This is going to be a big emphasis in the next year in the way we look at things. Um, you know, the stages of life, we've already started to address that. We've recently revived uh, the Fun Bunch you know, our ministry for those who are older. Um, you know, in the last year we've added the Moms and Little Ones Holy Hour, kind of a ministry to a much younger population. So having something at all the stages of human life, but then also all the stages of discipleship. Because people are all over, all over, right? From those who are just seekers or, you know, putting their toe in the shallow end of the pool all the way up to probably already modern day saints and we just don't fully realize it yet. So how do we have something for everyone at all of these stages of discipleship? And how do we organize what we do that to lead people continually deeper and deeper? You know, again, Tyler and Walter mostly have been thinking about this uh, a lot and trying to look at the big picture of what we have now and say, where are the gaps? <coughs> this path from not even a believer to like full-blown living saint, missionary, going out evangelizing the world. Where are the gaps in our program and how do we address those? And in the same way, all of the ministries that we have in the parish, all the various prayer groups and whatever, I'm trying to picture where do they fit in on this pathway? Again, to help understand where the gaps are, and also how do we help move people. Um, yeah, there'll be, there'll be a lot more about this coming in the next year. Third, authentic communion. Now communion is a great theologically deep word. Um, it's often used, or sometimes used interchangeably with community, but the difference is a community is formed as a result 
of horizontal relationships with each other. <clears throat> Communion is a community where the gel, the fundamental thing drawing them together is a vertical relationship with God. And that's how the church references herself, both in the worldwide sense, as well as at the level of a diocese, and at the level of a parish. We are a communion of the faithful. And so we foster a spirit of welcome, belonging, and integration into the mission of our parish community and the mission of the church. Um, so again, uh, this is an area where I think we've been doing a lot of work in terms of the first part, the welcoming. You know, we've stepped up in the last year or so a lot how we welcome new people. Um, we've amped up how we, you know, reach out to and welcome new parishioners. We now at most masses have people at the doorways handing out bulletins or handing out programs at the beginning, bulletins at the end, that whole kind of ministry of, of being greeters. Um, and so that's, I think, and, and we're showing like real fruits of that. Like I just, about two weeks ago, there was a couple who I talked to after a Sunday mass and um, they said, yeah, we've been coming here and we've decided we want to register. They said, you know, our old parish, you know, for Beacons of Light, they were kind of unhappy with how things went. So they said we've been, you know, visiting a bunch of different other churches to see where we would fit in. And I, of all of them, yours was the place we got the warmest welcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were greeted at the door, and then they like we got in, but somehow like didn't get the program, and like someone next to them like take, take mine, and I'll go get another. You know, so that's a great thing. Like that just made my little <laughs> pastor heart, you know, really really happy to hear that. <laughs> So authentic communion. And then now the next step, the integration into the mission. This is the part that I'm really also excited about. So we're going to be challenging every group and ministry in the parish. You know, everything from the walking with purpose women's Bible study to the sports boosters to everyone to say, okay, you guys go back with all this and you then give me a report on how you fit into this mission. And how are you integrated into this mission that we have as a parish as a whole? That, you know, we don't want anyone just doing their own thing, but whatever your own thing is, which is great, how does your own thing fit into the big thing that we're all a part of? So, if we have any ministry leaders of various groups here, you will be hearing from us <laughs> soon. And then finally, stewardship. Um, in gratitude, we cultivate and direct our gifts in a way that is both ambitious but also prudent. Ambitious, not in the secular sense of that word, but in the magnanimity sense of like big things, great things for God, um, but then also prudent. Recognizing that as many gifts as we do have, financially, human, humanly, um, people, hourly, like we aren't literally infinite. Like at some point we can't do everything. So we have to be prudent about how we allocate um, what we have. Then finally, yeah, the practical takeaway, I invite everyone to kind of ponder in your own life, like where do you see yourself in this parish in light of all of these things? And then again, for those who are involved in ministries of any sort, um, to start thinking about where it is your ministry um, or the ministries you're involved in, how do they fit into the big picture? Um, I think that would be a really great thing for people to do, and we'll continue to have uh, discussions about this. So there you go. That's the presentation. Thank you for your attention and listening, and if there's any uh, questions, I'd be happy. It's, let's see, 7, 16. Be happy to take any questions or just feedback, initial gut reaction.